somebody sent me an email say, bringing up that it is the 40th anniversary this summer. And if I could find this fucking email now, it would even be better. But it's, it's the 40th anniversary this summer of entrance music in wrestling. Because they're, according to them, they say that in, it was in July of 1979 that the fabulous Freebirds used entrance music in wrestling for the very first time in Memphis, Tennessee. I just found that program the other day. I posted it on Twitter. Well, see, you always have to hop in and try to top my story already before you even know where I'm going with this. <laughs> but I was there, by the way, and I, I bet you got that program from somebody that got it for me because I got a bunch of extras. Possibly. Either you or WFIA, one of the two. Well, because it was at the WFIA convention. I was there at the TV studio when the Freebirds debuted the first time they were called the Fabulous Freebirds, and I was there Monday night at the Mid-South Coliseum when they wrestled Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee and came to the ring to Freebird for the very first time ever. Because Nick Goulas wouldn't let him do it when he was working for them because he didn't understand that rock and roll music stuff, and he thought that the Freebirds were on the marijuana pills. <laughs> So that's what he actually asked somebody in the company one time. He said, one of the referees or somebody said, you think him free birds taking him marijuana pills. But while it was a very historic occasion and, and we will talk about that, why it wasn't the first time that entrance music was you and see Michael Hayes <laughs> will, will claim this, but he won't clarify to my knowledge. To my knowledge, it's the first time that uh, entrance music was used by, from Leonard Skinner. It was the first time that entrance music was used in, in connection with the actual gimmick of the tag team being Freebird for the Fabulous Freebirds. But it wasn't the first time rock and roll music was used because that was Chris Colt. He used Alice Cooper, Welcome to My Nightmare, right? Yeah. In Detroit in 78. Bad, bad Leroy Brown, Jim Croce, he was not exactly a rock artist. That's right. But bad, bad Leroy Brown in 1977 in Memphis used that. I was there and witnessed that. And we thought, boy, that's cool. <laughs> Which is the same thing as when the Freebirds came out of Memphis in 79. I looked at Brian Hildebrand, who was standing next to me. He was taking pictures, too. And he looked at me and we're like, this is great. This shit could catch on. <laughs> um, but in, in all honesty... Depending on how you want to, you know, use the term, whether it was rock and roll or what it was, entrance music, Gorgeous George obviously used that in the late 40s and early 50s, Pomp and Circumstance. That's where they stole it for Randy Savage. It was Gorgeous George, which it actually fit <laughs> Gorgeous George a lot better than I always thought it fit Randy Savage because he's got the the hairdo and the robes and the Georgie pins and the haughty attitude and he's coming out to pomp and circumstance but this is uh, so what i wanted to bring up to you mr and we'll start you for jeopardy we'll start your training and also to the cult members because now we have so many historians out there listening did gorgeous george steal the music from lord lansdowne or dizzy davis like he did some of the other stuff was there someone using music before gorgeous george has this been lost to history in terms of Lord Lansdowne, I think John Cosper would probably know the answer to that because I think he did a book on him, didn't he? Uh, I think he's working on it if it ain't already done. All right. I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know if that's another thing that Gorgeous George took from someone else and made his own. And here's the thing. I was not there, but I believe when Lawler had his first NWA title match with Briscoe, in 1974, I believe they either played 2001 because that was, you know, Jerry Jarrett liked that. That's why he made it the theme of his program or played something for Lawler to come to the ring. I know that that same year they had done the first music video for Lawler when the buildup was, uh, was for that title match with Jack Briscoe and he was taking on all the challengers and it had beaten all the top 10 they took the film camera, and it was filmed back then, and Mike Duncan, who was one of the announcers to Lawler's house, this still exists. I have a copy of this, where they interviewed him about Briscoe and, and showed him, you know, he's, at the time, he was uh, 22 years, uh, 1974, and it was before November, so he was 23 years old. No, 24 years old. At 24 years old, living in a nice house on the lake in Hendersonville next to all the country music stars. They were making a big deal out of him that he was, you know, 
the local celebrity, the, the starting to become the they were he was starting to do the king gimmick. He'd meet Bobby Shane shortly after this and get the crown and etc. And he had just done his first single, Bad News, which was an old John D. Loudermilk tune. Johnny Cash had done it in a bunch of country stars, and he recorded Bad News Travels Like Wildfire, Good News Travels Slow. They all call me old wildfire because everybody knows that I'm wildfire everywhere I go, always getting into trouble and leaving little girls that hate to see me go. They tried to hang me in Nashville. They did down in Tupelo, but I wouldn't choke. I broke the rope, and they had to let me go because I'm bad news. Blah, blah, blah. On and on, right? So they used that song <laughs> behind shots of Lawler going out in his boat and running people over in his fucking motorboat, right? And capsizing them on the fucking <laughs> lake out there in Hendersonville and being a heel. And and that was part of the promotion for the the upcoming world title match so that technically was kind of like the first music video and then they played around with doing others until they got the formula right when videotape came in and it was easier to edit but uh anyway so bad bad leroy brown was 1977 chris colt was 1978 the Freebirds came along in 79 but that's when it really hit and that's when people started copying it because like everything else whether it be the the Tag teams patterned after the Road Warriors or the Rock and Roll Express or or whatever else in wrestling. When something works, people copy it to death till it doesn't work anymore. But even until the mid '80s, um, everybody didn't get music up and down the card. For the you know most of the time, it was just the stars, JYD, and maybe one or two other people, depending on who they were, would get music in mid south. Lawler and and. Uh, Dundee and the, actually Dundee didn't have music for quite a while in Memphis. Lawler had it. Dutch used it. Austin Idol had heartthrob by the uh, idolaters. Uh, but most of the guys on the card still didn't have music because it was still special just for the main event guys. And then when was it by what? 87, 88. Just everybody had a song, whether anybody gave a shit about him or not. Uh, the WWF for the most part. There were still guys like Jim Duggan didn't have music, I don't think, until like 1990. There were still some big stars that didn't have music. But like by 1990, everyone has music. And, and now everybody thinks it's always been that way. But it, 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 you used to be able to tell whether a guy was over or not by the response he got when he walked out of the locker room and came to the ring. Because for the guys that were really over, the people were screaming or booing or doing something from the first time that they saw him and, and it, you know, but music is like a, 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 a cholesterol medicine. It's a sin eater. It covers a lot of sins. If, if, if guys like the rock and roll express that were so over when they'd play their music, that just goosed the fucking pop even louder or the road warriors. When they heard the first notes of iron man, that goosed the people to pop even louder because they were over to begin with. But for guys that people didn't give a shit about when that music hit, it was something playing to cover up the fact that you could hear crickets chirping. If that fucking song wasn't going, everybody else was scratching their balls because they hadn't manscaped and, uh, and just, you know, and it was, so it, it could cover a lot of sins when everybody got music, especially down at the bottom of the card. Hey, but I'll ne I'll never forget. Well, go go ahead. What were you going to well, say? It's a couple of questions. What one I was going to ask um, is with the Midnight Express theme song because that is one of the most identifiable ones for a wrestling act of the 1980s. Is obviously Midnight Express when you guys coming out. Had Dennis ever used anything in Southeastern or any other time with any other variation of the Midnight Express? Yes, as a matter of fact, I still have the album. <laughs> I think Norvell picked it. I think Norvell Austin picked it because there was a BT Express album from the is either late seventies or early eighties, right about the time that they, uh, that they formed the midnight express with Dennis Condry, Randy Rose and Norvell Austin. One of the songs it's, it's kind of an instrumental, but kind of not, but it's one of those funky BT express songs from the early late seventies, early eighties or whatever. It's here comes the express and there's whistles and there's horns and there's da -da 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 and it sounds you know a little berry whitish a little fucking groove there but then there's a chorus here comes the express express and then there's a fucking horn and a fucking train whistle and all this other shit <laughs> but it it was it was it was it's a good song but 
I've, I never had any other thought for, so anyway, they used that. And actually I got, I had the album because I brought it home and taped it to use cassettes in the Memphis territory. Cause we couldn't play records, but you know, so I've made cassettes for them. Um, and I played it cause I used to carry the fucking boom box around it, You know, in the early days, the fucking arenas didn't know how to play music at a wrestling show. They'd have to have hired somebody special. So I just, you know, to run the fucking soundboard or whatever. All they did was turn the PA on and off. I would take the big boom box and have the tapes queued up and hold the microphone in front of the speaker, and here you go. But um, it, it was unusual still at that time for heels to get music. Usually it was the baby faces, right? But when we went to, uh, but they had done it for the midnight in Tennessee, when we went to Louisiana, Watts wanted to do anything that he could to make us seem like a bigger deal, you know, cause he was giving us the big push. So we got music same like when, when we went to Crockett and dusty said, nobody touches Cornette and the midnight express goes over everybody. We even, we did battle Royals at spot shows where Bobby and Dennis split the money. When do you ever hear that? Cause du that was the way dusty was doing it. Uh, we're going to keep the heat on the manager and these guys are not going to get beat until it's time. With Watts, it was he's going to give us a big push and put us over on television, but also, and he's going to let the manager do the introduction because he thought that that makes it stand apart and give the heels music because that makes them stand out. And I naturally said, we got to have Chase because I already had the disco single, <laughs> it was in my collection <laughs> because the ICW television program, the PAFOs had used that as their opening theme music. And they had this big montage. It was ridiculous. It was like they used like a two-minute opening theme because they had they had really good wrestlers when they opened up with Malenko and Roop and Garvin and Orton Jr. and Lanny and Savage. So they've got all these highlights from the first taping of that stiff elbow drop Malenko used to give and Garvin knocking somebody out with a punch and doing the Garvin stomp and Savage coming off the top with a double sledge and Lanny doing a moonsault and Bob Orton Jr. doing all of his shit, this really high level work in this little tiny TV studio. So they put all this fucking footage together into the goddamn to show open you'd ever seen. And it went, like I said, like two minutes because <laughs> I guess they figured, fuck, this is better than the TV we're actually shooting. And they used the the chase, the theme from the Midnight Express that we used in our incarnation of the team. So I had the music. It was in my, in my mind. I'd seen highlight videos already. So Dennis wasn't married to any music. That's why I say probably Norvell fucking picked it. And I said, hey, let's use the music from the movie, The Midnight Express. And that's how that got started. And we just kept it up. And then with Randy Savage, because so many people think of pomp and circumstance with him, that wasn't his original theme music either. No, he used fame. Yeah. Uh, he came out, and this was, <laughs> looking back, it looks so fucking cheap and cheesy, but it didn't strike us at the time that way because we knew, I guess me and Bolin and, and the Weasel Dooley and the people that knew wrestling knew that this guy, even though he's on this outlaw television program, is one of the best wrestlers in the business athletically. And just look at the shit he does and the gimmick he's got in the promos. It was the highlight. You, you watched ICW television to either see if they were going to have a, a match between two of their stars, which every once in a while they would, and that would be really high level work or just to see Savage. And he'd come at the immediately fame by Irene Cara would start fucking playing even before he came out because the announcer would be standing and we're about to talk to him. And then he'd come out and he'd have a pocket full of confetti <laughs> and he'd bring and he'd throw his own confetti. <laughs> right. And <laughs> that's my favorite still and freak out, man, guaranteed personified Randy macho man. Savage won the ICW world heavyweight championship March 13, 1979 in Halifax, Nova Scotia by defeating a leap and Lanny Poffo. Dig it. Guaranteed personified. I'm coming to your town. I'm coming to your town. I'm going to do a thing. I'm going to do a thing, man. Freak out. And then he'd throw more confetti. That's pretty good. And, and you know, and, he, and he's got the cheap, you know, shit before he had money to make the real robes and everything. But it fucking, on anybody else, it would have been a clown show. But it just, he was so good and so magnetic. So anyway, he, that was, uh, once again, early. As a matter of fact, 
fuck, they went on the air in 1979. I don't know if Savage may not have, but poor Michael Hayes is going to be hanging himself in his closet after this show. Savage <laughs> may have beat you too, Michael. When did the Von Erichs first have music? I mean, I think by 81 they had it, but when did they actually introduce music into world class? It, I'm thinking it was after 79 because there was, you know, there was the time where Armand Hussein was the top manager and, you know, poor Bundy as a rookie was the top heel and Fritz was still wrestling. And it was a little, yeah. it was a, the old, older generations club, but the, the boys, David started using LaGrange first, I think. And that would have been 80 ish, 81 ish. One of our Dallas folks maybe can tell us, but obviously when the birds came in, it just blew up because then they get, then each, each Von Eric had an individual song. Plus they, I think they'd still use LaGrange for all the boys and the, and the free birds. And then here comes ice, Iceman Parsons used foreigner cold as ice. That, that doesn't look like that would have been what Iceman was listening to in his fucking car. When did he use that? Didn't he? Wasn't it? What oh, it, we are family, Sister Sledge. Well, who? Where did he? Use, I've heard. I saw him come out somewhere. Maybe that. Oh, you know what? Maybe that's. Ha <laughs> We were on a show with him in fucking St. Louis and Kansas City in the Central States. I think they. Maybe that's just what they had. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I remember seeing that, going, "What the fuck?" That. But anyway, um. But yeah, it's it spread from there, the early 80s, and then MTV, and that's where Jerry Jarrett got the idea for the Fabulous Ones to do the videos because he was, well, first he just did a Fabs video in front of a black curtain and put it to the Billy Squire music, but then when, the, when ZZ Top started doing those videos with the cars and the girls, they would just remake the ZZ top videos with the fabs and Jerry had an old fucking car, antique car. And I, uh, you know, they somehow the fabs found the women. I don't know, you know, uh, <laughs> but and it became the MT and Memphis did it first, but then that, that was a big deal in the talent exchange with Watts was that Jerry Jarrett brought Randy West, who was editing that stuff down to show Joel Watts and Watts's TV crew how to do the the videos so they could do them on Terry Taylor and Magnum TA and the rock and roll down there. And, and, and the same thing happened. Here came a bunch of young people that were watching MTV, the girls. <laughs> when we first got there, you know, the first week or two, I noticed that the, the female population was only like 30% of the crowds, which was, you know, half of what it was in Memphis at the time. And of course now it's about 20 times what it, what it, is today but by the time they played a few weeks of those videos and the rock and roll got on tv and they saw terry taylor it was the same thing crowds were 60 percent women i gotta tell you because of joel watts i can't hear freeze frame and i think of that stupid terry taylor video to this day <laughs> hey it was better than jerry jarrett gave him some days are diamonds some days are stones <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the hard times won't leave me alone. I have no idea. He must Jerry must have just liked that song. Yeah, I think it was John Denver or some shit. That's when it took off though. Like 83, like you know, the Freebirds introduced it in 79, but really when they get on TBS and when they make their debut on TBS with the music playing while Gordon's interviewing them, that's where the impact really hit because that was when it was the highest rated show on cable television. Yeah. Because there wasn't much cable television. But also <laughs> by 83. Hogan had Eye of the Tiger, which elevated him. Just that music, just coming out to that, elevated him a little bit more easily identifiable with the movie he had just been in. And of course, even Jimmy Valiant took off. People forget how big he got in Mid-Atlantic in 83 coming out to The Boy from New York City. Well, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, um, Jimmy Valiant had music by the end, either the end of 1979 or the first of 80 here in Memphis, because son of a gypsy, he recorded it here in Memphis and he started coming out. As a matter of fact, that, that is when, now that you mention it, Handsome's music is when I decided to buy that boom box. Oh, wow. Because he was probably besides after Lawler who would do it for special occasions. Lawler was a, the Freebirds were only here for a couple months, as we know, and then they got traded down to Louisiana. 
because uh, you know I, uh, at the time Danny Davis and Wayne Ferris and Larry Latham the Blonde Bombers were established as the top heel team and they worked the style better um but uh Jimmy had music all the time so I ended up buying that boombox because and then other people started getting it so I was in more demand but you know <laughs> Obviously, when it comes to that era, you brought it up briefly, but JYD coming out to another one bites the dust is oh. really one of the big ones. And it's perfect. It's the per- when we recently talked about this on the super podcast, when he switched to atomic dog, what a mistake <laughs> that was. It changed the whole dynamic. And luckily they quickly reversed course because they realized what a mistake it was. Yeah. Well, another one bites the dust was here comes this badass junkyard dog. It's going to rip my head off. Atomic dog was like this fun George Clinton. Let's have a fucking party thing. And it just changed the the perception. It would have been like the Road Warriors coming out to Don't Worry, Be Happy. You know, it, it, I think the Road Warriors, Iron Man fit them probably as good as anything, any music ever fit anybody in Freebird with the Freebirds. But uh, but sometimes, you know, once the people would get used to it, then when when they'd change their music, you know, it, it would hurt. I, I like the change. Rock and roll had... Rock and roll, rock and roll is king by ELO. Yeah. But here's how cognizant Jerry Jarrett was. One of the lines is, "Come along with me to a land of make believe." He edited that out so that it would that would <laughs> never play on his wrestling program. It would just it was seamlessly edited, so it went right over that fucking line because Jerry Jarrett he examined things. <laughs> Everybody else just played the fucking song, but then they switched. In uh, it, when they reunited in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, we used old time rock and roll, and that fit even better then because it it just you know it acknowledged the history. Oh, who did that really bad cover of Loggins and Messina? Your mama don't dance and your daddy you don't rock and roll when they came back in 1990. I don't know, but I wish they'd have covered it up. <laughs> anyway, so there you have it, folks. It, the entrance music question and the way music got into wrestling is not as as cut and dried as some people think. And I remember one time I just got into business. So it was 1982 and I'm at Memphis TV and I'm sitting there in the break room that they used as the heels locker room, right? The heels dressing room. And buddy Wayne, of course was there and buddy came to you at TV every week. It was his ring and, and he'd sit back and kibitz and tell stories about Sputnik Monroe and Billy Wicks. And, and when he and Bob Ramstead were the world tag team champions, And, you know, somebody else came out and they played music, right? And then they played a music video that they'd done. They were just doing starting the Fabs videos. And everybody was going ape shit over them because it was so revolutionary. But Buddy was sitting there. He's like, well, you know, Jim, I talked to my next door neighbor. And his tongue was so thick, sometimes it'd get in his way. But his whole giant head, I love Buddy Wayne. But, well, Jim, I talked to my next door neighbor yesterday. I said, did you watch the wrestling program last week? And my neighbor said, no, I'm just not into music. He says it just everything. Now it's a music program. <laughs> he, he knew that was going to be the end of the business as we knew it. But anyway. And when you guys first started playing music videos in Memphis, you didn't call them music videos. You called them specials. Specials. Yes. Because the term music video was really just starting to become used because MTV went on the air in 1981, right? So music video wasn't a, you know, an all purpose term. It wasn't really something that most people were talking about, except if you got, and I didn't even get cable in Louisville. I had to have Mike Duncan, the announcer, tape six hours of MTV on a VHS and bring it up to me. Cause we didn't, we didn't have cable where I lived here yet. So <clears throat> it wasn't a, so Jerry, Jerry just said, Oh, we've got a special, <laughs> a special production, a special on the fabs or a special on Jerry Lawler or whatever. And it was real special because they didn't pay any rights fees for the music either. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when, when in Smoky Mountain, I asked Rick Rubin before we ever even did our first TV taping. I said, Rick, I said, the music is such a, a big part of the entrances and the guys. And he agreed. I said, well, you're in the music business. I said, should we be paying anybody? Are we going to get in trouble? He said, I make rap records. We cop other, copy other people's music and sell it. He said, just do it until somebody tells you not to. We did it for four years. Nobody ever said a goddamn word. Well, Vince McMahon was really flying close to the sun in 1985. The show began with Thriller. Michael, <laughs> Michael Jackson's Thriller, where Hulk Hogan <laughs> came to the ring. Every single commercial break, either Owner of a Lonely Heart when you went to Piper's Pit, or <laughs> Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Well, obviously, they had the Cindy Lauper connection, but Modern Love by David Bowie. It was nonstop hit music. It helped make the show. 
but it was also why he quickly rushed into the wrestling album and got everyone those really bad songs. Really bad. Yeah. Even with Rick Derringer on the album. JYD went from Another One Bites the Dust to Grab Them Cakes <laughs> with Vicky Sue Robinson. And even she couldn't turn that beat around. Ha ha ha. See what I did there? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> 